Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. Welcome to the Pine Letter Podcast. My name is Paul LeFavre. I'm here with my Ranger buddy, Mike Blackburn. And today is Friday, the 18th of November, 2022. Uh, today, we have brought into the G-Base a SEAL. This is the first SEAL I think we've had. Uh, you know, SEALs are barrel-chested freedom fighters. Uh, and But they, they just do things just a little different. Uh, but today, we have a man named Matt Bracken who is uh, one of my personal heroes, also Mike's, uh, a man who has authored, uh, I I believe, seven books, six or seven books. Among those are Enemies, Foreign and Domestic. He has been been on numerous uh, YouTube uh, chats, uh, podcasts. Television, uh, radio. One heck of a mile American. uh, And he's a little bit older than us, so he's kind of like our older brother. But, uh, sir... Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast. Yeah, th- thank you for having me. Um, one thing I, I would like to um, to clarify: <laughs> I, I was I was a Navy SEAL. Uh, I went to the University of Virginia Naval ROTC and got commissioned out of there. And my first orders were to Bud's training, so the um, Navy paid for college, but I, I was never really planning to make a career out of the Navy. I just wanted adventure. I wanted to be a shooter. I thought that the that UDT SEALs would be the most fun during my um, obligated commitment to the Navy. So that's what I did. And the reason I'm saying all that is I did not make a career out of SEAL team. I was, you know, platoon commander, went to Beirut. I, I did all kind of, you know, cool stuff, blocking in and out of submarines, parachuting, mm-hmm. all that stuff. But I want to give all my respect to every, you know, regular infantry grunt that served from wherever to wherever, just standing the duty in his, you know, in his boots with no special training, no special gear, because, you know, a lot of these guys they they endured the, uh, they they endured real hell. A lot of them wrecked their health, either through, uh, you know, being close to an IED, traumatic brain injury, or, or a back ruin from carrying a hundred pounds day in and day out. And I give all my respect to them. So yeah, well said, sir. Yeah, I thank had you. To, I had the good, I had the good seal training. Mm. You know what I mean? I had a good experience, lifelong friends, but, um, I was not in combat. I was in Beirut where people were walking around with guns, but I wasn't in firefights. And I, I in no way, may, in no way want to imply that I was, you know, like the SEALs or Rangers or Special Forces or whoever that have been in combat on and off for the last 20 years. Yeah, I appreciate They're, They, get, your, all, they yeah. get all the props and respect. Yeah, I appreciate your humility. And uh, uh, now one thing that you have done is you've been in uh, the ocean at night in the dark with, with animals that could eat you. And uh, you just trudge right along and fin right along yeah, we, and so we that's, actually that's a whole we other world love that, <laughs> Frog, frogmen love that see that's a there's a um i forget what saying it is you know, while you're sleeping we're creeping kind of thing yeah yes frogmen and, love the water and if it's dark and dirty it's even better and the reason that frogmen <laughs> love the water is everybody else is so scared of it so you know anytime we get a chance to um have a fight near the water we're going in the water yeah. awesome but you know so so the whole thing about like parachuting uh into a dark ocean or um coming out of a submarine in the middle of the night we're not afraid of the little fishes that are in the water right it doesn't even cross our mind <laughs> hey uh so what's and you're a humble man i appreciate that sir and uh but uh, you've done more things than uh you know i've probably thought of doing uh but Something else that, yeah, uh, but it, yeah. it, I, that's 
maybe in some ways, but tens of thousands of grunts have a story in Afghanistan or, or Iraq that maybe there are a few family and friends know about. Maybe they they belong to the VFW or something and the guy at the next bar stool, but all of these guys have a story that's like people that are like emotionally, physically torn apart and they're going to carry it for the rest of their life and nobody's calling them on a talk show. Yeah. Because you know what I mean? Exactly. I always I always go back to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. But no, that's no, and, and I, and it needs to be said. Yeah, we appreciate that. And, uh, and of course that's why you know, that's our audience. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we're we here for the Warrior, and, and and one of the reasons why we brought you on, Matt, is because we really wanted to talk about uh, something that we thought uh, would you'd be the perfect guy to have a discussion with, and that is a lot of us, especially uh, those of us that did make the military a career, um, are sitting back right now, and we're really concerned about readiness. We're concerned about our fellow warriors that are still in uniform today because – um, not only the jab, but just overall readiness, training, um, and the decisions that are coming out of the current administration. Um, you're you're a guy that we thought about uh, bringing on to talk about this stuff because this is this is a concern of a lot of warriors out here. Yeah, I I um I remember a a quote or a a, a thought by Ann Coulter at least a decade ago, nothing to do with military readiness, but she said, if, if, you know, all of these mistakes and errors and, oh, my goodness, is all fall in the same direction, it's not a coincidence. It's a plan. It's sabotage. And if you, like, pretend not to notice, then you're like the sucker. You're the rube. You're the mark. And if all of these things are, are affecting readiness badly, and you separate them into categories like, okay, let's pretend that 120-pound women can be, you know, infantry grunts. They can serve in artillery. They can serve in armor. You know, they're going to pick you up and throw you over your back and over back and carry you out of. If you know, that's like one example. Oh, let's pretend that it won't affect morale if a dude walks into the chaplain's office and says, "I feel like a chick," and she's immediately like, "Oh, by all means." We'll bend over backwards. But if a guy walks in there and says, I don't want to take an experimental mRNA uh, injection, yeah, it's like, you gotta, how do you how do you get 10 neighbors to swear to it? Get the last five pastors to swear to your, you know, it, it's just, it's so obvious that they're trying to run conservative, primarily European, not necessarily you know, heterosexual males out of the military. Mm. Okay, and you can say, well, that's their woke values. Maybe that's that's crazy, but, you know, that's what they're doing. But how does that affect readiness? It's absolute poison. It's sabotage. Mm. Everything that they're... Or even just take the war in Ukraine. Okay, you can, you can believe the narrative. Putin woke up, invaded Ukraine. He's a terrible guy. But we're depleting our active duty war stocks down to the bare bones. Javelins, stingers, you know, high Mars, 155, 105, it's all gone. Mm. They, you know, things that take 10, 20 years to, to build up, we've shipped it over and fired it, and it's gone. So if all of these things keep happening in the same direction. It's, it's not a coincidence, it's sabotage. It's, it's like that saying, you know, uh, one time is happenstance, two times is a coincidence, three times is, enter- is enemy action. We're up to what, 10, 12 times? And, it, and if you keep getting suckered like this, and you just keep looking at each individual thing and go, well, I guess that's plausible because they're woke, or I guess that's plausible because we got to defend democracy in Ukraine, all of these things stacked up is absolutely wrecking military readiness. Mm. And it and it just seems like they are 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 gratified in absolutely running the the backbone of the military out of the military. Who is going to be left? Mm. So all of these things added together to me 
it spells sabotage. It doesn't spell coincidence and happenstance. It spells sabotage. I've always been concerned with the fact that we have a large percentage of of folks who are deciding that they're just they want to do they want to go do something else. You know, they're not interested in making the military career. They're not interested in in, in reenlisting. And primarily, uh, what we're seeing is the best and brightest. Uh, those young men, um, you know, that are have the natural ability and talent that are just like you and I and Paul. We're drawn to the adventure, the excitement, the challenge, the camaraderie with fellow warriors. But they're not finding it uh, in the military, and they're just bored. And they're not, yep. they're not interested in the woke ideology. And so they're, they're, they're going to go try to find that, uh, scratch that itch someplace else, but it's not going to be in uniform. And well, this, the, woke, the, woke ide- the woke ideology, even like five years ago, I would have said uh, – Maybe instead of going into the military to become, uh, you know, Ranger, SF, SEAL team, try Coast Guard and go for a rescue swimmer or something like, or even even at the local level, firefighter, EMT. It's not as infected by the woke ideology, the cultural Marxism. But even the Coast Guard now, as you know, part of the DOD, I think it still is, or DOT, but it's under DOD. Anyway, even the Coast Guard is going to be all woke up. But um, I think that a lot of these guys, either they're going to maybe fall into some uh, local training if they're lucky, if they have, like, relatives and friends. There's, you know, very good training opportunities that were, you can frankly get – most of the best military skills, if you if you paired up and mentored with you know some old boomer deer hunter, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna learn more about uh, you know stealthy movement in the woods and uh, you know things that will have applic- general the, the kind of uh, skills you might have learned in the infantry. Uh, not everybody can find somebody like that, but um, even to get a job like you know be a welder and go to the the worst hardship place, you know, wherever, wherever they're sending the, the, uh, you know, welders into the jungle or the tundra, you know, get that kind of a skill because the guys that you're going to be surrounded by, they're not woke. Not yet. Because you can't build a pipeline across, you know, rugged terrain based on woke, wokeness. So you can pretend to have a military. You can pretend to have a military in garrison that's a quarter chicks, and you can pretend, you know, make believe that you're going to fight a war, but you can't build a pipeline that way, or or a, or a tower, you know, a, a like a cell phone or radio tower. You can't you can't do that on woke ideology. So the 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 skills like um, electrical linemen, the, the the guy that might have been a gone to the military first, I'd say. I'd say apprentice, apprentice as an electrician and try to get into, uh, you know, the hardcore uh, uh, linemen, you know, kind of, of uh, end of it. Because the guys you're going to be with are no bullshit. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's like what it would have been in the military 20, 30 years ago. No bullshit. Just hardcore guys that you have to be hardcore or you can't get the job done. Right. Yeah, you know, there's 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 no like uh, woke ideology that is where where we're in pretend land. Mm. Yeah. But I mean that you know the shooting is you know pulling the trigger is a good thing. You can learn that with an old hunter. But as far as the skills go, I would say you know firefighter, volunteer, or or you know paid salaried, EMT, um, welder electrical linemen, I would get that kind of a skill. And then when the mil- when the when America gets back on the on an even keel, hopefully, you know, maybe you can still do something in the military and you'll bring other skills to it. But but going into the military today is like accepting that like, you know, men can get pregnant, hundred and twenty pound chick is as strong as a two hundred and fifty pound man. Where you have to pretend bullshit. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it's see, about it either. Yeah. It yeah. seems like uh, when we were asleep, at least when I was asleep at the wheel, uh, you were uh, thinking this through uh, back in your, your book, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic, came out in 2003. Uh, yeah. It seems like you were putting your finger on a lot of these, uh, you know, pre-woke ideas, and you kind of looked in the crystal ball and saw this a lot of this happening. Uh, did what, what back then, um, or I, I would maybe I could ask, what's the origin, if you would, of woke? Where where does this all begin? I've always wanted to know that. Maybe your, just your well, thoughts on that. Even before even before what you what you would call alternative media, I was kind of like seeking out the alternative media counter narrative um, point of view before the internet existed. Mm. Like I I used to read, you know, people can laugh or chuckle, but this is one of the few outlets where what you would now call like um, alt-right media had any kind of a view um, was uh, uh, Soldier of Fortune magazine, for example. Okay, the, the, like reporters, correspondents coming back from Rhodesia or right. um, you know Nicaragua, El Salvador, stuff that you would never in a million years to go on the nightly news in, in the USA. So I was I was always like kind of seeking out the um, the counter narrative. What's the true narrative? I, I picked up early. We're being fed bullshit. Yeah. Now we know it as the mockingbird media. The all of these correspondents that are that are basically just page chills. In fact, today, uh, Glenn Greenwald I think has on Twitter. I'm not. I'm banned on Twitter, but I still go to like look at things like links. Um, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald had a thing. And it's like a retweet from Ed Snowden, mm. and it's about a, it's a 1983 interview that he cooked up where the correspondent is explaining to the interviewer about how the CIA feeds disinformation into the media, and how like 80 percent of the time they totally go for it. Mm. So when I see like a Catherine Harridge on Fox, it's like she's a total mockingbird. She's like. Just lapping it up and spilling it out, you know the, the the party line, and and I was always looking behind the veil for like that man, you know the the man behind the curtain, you know that I that, that we're being told bullshit. What's the real story? And another so so I was always looking for a way to convey to people most of what you're learning on mainstream media. It's bullshit. You know it, it's. It's a narrative. It's like a Madison Avenue ad campaign. People sit around a table saying, how can we fool these suckers? What will they believe? What's plausible? What will pull on their heartstrings? What will like hit their patriotism reflex? And we'll use those memes and get them to march the way we want them to march. So it's always on the lookout for that. And then... When I was at, at another factor that led to my writing Enemies Foreign and Domestic was I, um, I had been at SEAL Team 2 when SEAL Team 6 was being formed, and they were in like a building next to ours. And uh, I got to meet the people at the very beginning of that. And I, I, by just the rumors and stories floating around in the early days of SEAL Team 6 under um, Commander M., Mm-hmm. That rhymes with Cinco. <laughs> anyway, uh, they had immediately, once they got a blank credit card, like a, here's a credit card you can use. It's on a black budget. Nobody can check. Just get everything done fast. And I can understand how that works because, it, you know, it, it was effective in the sense that you have to go on the open budget outside of military channels and just buy shit fast because we need it now. But very quickly, the same guys, it was like, you mean, really, nobody's checking? We got a black budget? I could buy, like, a hundred gold-plated whatevers, and nobody's auditing them? So if I, like, bought a hundred and sold 50 and kept the money? So, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm trying to be vague here. Mm-hmm. But this was, like, the origins of SEAL Team 6, and, and we saw... If you get a black budget and nobody's checking, it's all under national security, it will be taken advantage of. 
Yeah, it's human nature. And, and SEAL Team 6 is just like a pea compared to a watermelon when you're saying, what about the next fighter? How come it's costing $300 million a plane? Mm. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the money that is shoveled into this, it's like, don't ask questions. Just shovel in the money. And most of the money isn't going into the airplane. So anyway, I used that experience of SEAL Team 6 to, cr- to kind of create the uh, bureaucratic scenario where an ATF small unit might decide if we pulled a false flag operation, blamed it on, you know, the right wing gun culture that would lead to the banning of all semi-automatic weapons in America because of the reflex against like a stadium massacre. Well, the right wingers won't believe it. They'll, they'll resist, which means our unit will have to have like a, you know, hundred times bigger budget. We'll need a hundred times more guys to go disarm all these right wingers. It's a very in, in the novel. It's a very uh, cynical and calculated plan. Okay, like a J six kind of a thing. If we do a false flag stadium massacre, blame it on the right wingers who won't give up their rifles. Well, they're going to need a shit ton more of ATF agents to go get those rifles. Hmm. And it's it's not. And, and the ATF guys don't even give a shit about the rifles. All they care about is they're going to need a way bigger budget. And this, I wrote this in the wake of uh, 9-11, when if you, if you put a graph of, like, say, the FBI budget next to the ATF budget, after 9-11, the FBI budget took off like a rocket. And the ATF budget is still, like, you know, dribbling along, chasing, like, outlaw motor ga- uh, motorcycle gangs and, you know, people that are making homemade suppressors and these in the novel a couple of ATF guys are like hey if we had a good stadium massacre we'd be right up there with 911 mm. and they'd need a hundred times more ATF agents and and we would like go right to the top of the you know, pyramid anyway that was that was you know written in 2002 2003 and I've been following this ever since, but you can see I'm kind of a, maybe a bit cynical. <laughs> <laughs> a healthy dose of cynicism. Listen, like, I, here's, here's a question, and I'm just kind of curious what your, your thoughts on. To me, it's, you know, every day we're getting uh, new re- revelations uh, of the dangers of the mRNA uh, COVID uh, vaccine, supposedly vaccine. Um, yeah, I don't even, I, I won't even... I don't even like to put the word vaccine. I, yeah, vaccine used to have a. I mean, well, it has I mean, a specific the, meaning, and it's not. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it doesn't, doesn't even, prevent transmission or yeah, infection. It doesn't it's not even. A vaccine. Yeah, it doesn't even exist. The, the, the meaning doesn't even exist anymore. But anyway, right. Why it's are they called st- the jab or the injection or? Yeah. So why are they? Why are they still giving service members and others a hard time, uh, especially as you know now in 2022 we're starting to learn that uh, this this thing is really harming folks. And, and and their and their spouses too. Let's not forget about the spouses of military members that uh, are having difficulty with uh, pregnancies and uh, fertility and everything else that's happening. Well, it's a, it's a multi layered thing, but it's, I think it's fairly easy to understand. Our our flag ranks, our generals and our admirals, are selected by the Senate. So they ha- their name is put on a list, like a pledge list, like it's a frat or something. You know, scratch that guy off. You know, we don't like that guy. The Democrats put on super liberals. They know, or like, you know, this guy is freaking Che Guevara. They put him on the general list. The GOP, they're like, well, let's all be fair and balanced. And, you know, if they put like 100 people forward, we got to, you know, go for them. So they'll go for us. So the, the GOP puts forward people on the, on the, uh, flag rank, admiral, generalist, that they think are like the best guys, middle of the road, the Democrats put on communists. The, the GOP are such cucks that they go, okay, well, you know, unless somebody absolutely said, I, you know, I hate America and want to blow it up, we'll approve them for general. So 
if you do this year after year, you wind up with flag ranks that are hard left. Because you've got milk toast GOP nominees that are like, I don't want to rock the boat, just get me my pension. And on the left side, the Democrats put forward like, Che Guevara should be a general in the American army, okay? So it tilts that way very strong. Then then you've got just the, the whole dynamic of, I'll do anything for my pension. I've got 17 years in. I've got kids that are like in high school. They're going to be in college next year. I can't on principle say, no, I agree. You shouldn't take the jab. You know, to, to the, the troops in that command, the ops boss, the XOCO, they're not going to say, you're right. I think this is fucked. You know, we're, we're giving poison to people. All they're saying is, all they're hearing is, I've been told from higher that I'm, that I'm like, only at 92%, and if I'm not at 99%, I'm at risk of not getting promoted, I'll be passed over, I'll be out on the street with 17 years. I mean, this is happening right now. I was talking to somebody yesterday at this Frogman reunion in Fort Pierce, Florida. He had a 20-year Navy career, then a 20-year civilian career at a special operations related uh, uh, command. And with three months until his second retirement, he got a call from some freaking colonel at SOCOM in Tampa saying, I see here you haven't had your your jab. Mm. And he said, well, here at this command, they don't even care. And it's like, you know, well, if you've got to get the jab. And he had to do like this severe tap dance in the last three months to get, you know, re- clear and retired. They're speak- and it's not that the guy in Tampa, it's not that the colonel in Tampa thinks that it's a good thing, you should get it. It's that the pressure on him is so great that he's calling people and putting the pressure on them because everybody wants to get their freaking pension. Yeah. All of these C-words want to get their freaking pension. And, yeah. and it... it a lot of people can't do anything about it. I, I was on, I just saw a thing on Gates of Gates of Vienna website, which was Dean Weingarten, who was actually a liberal professor at Evergreen uh, University College or University in Washington. He got in the news because when they had like No Whites Day three or four years ago, he said that's bullshit. I'm not going to stay away because it's like you know No White Colonialism Day. In other words, whites stay away from the campus. We're all celebrating the No White Day. He wouldn't play. Well, he's kind of become like a counter uh, censorship, almost a conservative. And I just saw this thing on Gates of Vienna. He's he's interviewing like an F-16 pilot, a nurse, different people, and and they're saying even now today, in fall of 2022, they are still like jacking the. Uh, you know, twisting the arms of people to get this freaking jab, even if the C- even after the CDC has said you don't need to do it, there shouldn't be any difference between the jab and the unjab because it doesn't prevent transmission or infection. At this point, it's a control mechanism. Like you must obey. It's like one of those memes, you know, obey. And it's also, I think, at at the top, and this is above the rank of the rank of the. All of these, all of these cocks who are just um, uh, so so aligned with getting their pension, no matter if they have to sell their soul, they'll get their pension. But much further up, I think at the top, it's a depop- depopulation agenda. I think the mRNA is intended to like affect pregnancy, sterility, yeah. kill a lot of young people, weaken them. And in the military, it's the most shameful of all because. Why would you get rid of your most healthy, uh, you know, your, your best combat fighters, you know, your, your grunts, your, your armored guys, you know, your, art, your arty guys? Why would you get rid of them? I mean, you're either going to weaken them because they don't need it. It's like a 100 to 1 worse ratio. Well, what benefit will it give me compared to myocarditis and all these other effects? 
Why would you poison your own freaking troops? Why would you do that? Just for your pension? Because you're such a robot? You're such a salute, obey robot? Or, or is it because, you know, you just don't care. I, I'll do anything for my pension. But the guys that are giving the orders at the top, I mean above Millie, they, I think it's a depopulation agenda. And it's just so embarrassing and shameful that our own military brass, nobody will stand up and say, this is, this is wrong. You know, at, the, at the end of the Vietnam War, there's a guy named Colonel David Hackworth. He was a combat uh, commission in Korea. He went from, like, you know, private to lieutenant on the battlefield. And in Vietnam, he was the youngest colonel. And he had a lot of very, uh, you know, uh, very excellent innovations in Vietnam. He went on, I mean, this is like ancient history, but he wrote a great book. If anybody wants to go on Amazon used books and find this, it's called About Face by Colonel David Hackworth. He yep. died probably 15 years ago. But Famous book. he went on TV in his uniform and said, what they're telling you about Vietnam is wrong. It's lies. We can never win the way we're doing it. And it's just useless. People are dying for nothing. So he, as a colonel, he basically, you know, committed uh, career suicide no pension, no promotion, no nothing, because he felt it was the right thing to do. And today, where they're poisoning our own troops, where's a single colonel or general that will say, this is wrong? Mm. What we're doing is wrong. Where are they? It's so embarrassing. This is why I wrote these books, to get people to like look beyond the, you know, the, the uh, official narrative, look for the real narrative. That's why I wrote my books. And I hope I, I hope it makes some kind of difference. At least, at least I'll you know, I'll go to my maker saying I did what I could to like throw a light on this. But I'm so embarrassed and ashamed of our colonels and generals. I'm so embarrassed for them mm. that they do not have the courage to say, "Why are we poisoning our troops? Why are we kicking out our best troops?" You know, the, 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 that the southern the southern soldier the they call it the, they call it the mag it's uh, Mississippi Alabama Georgia that's like twenty percent of our infantry is mag they are not enlisting and that's another readiness that's factor they are not enlisting because their relatives that have been in the military for generations are saying don't do it because they're military now. It's on some kind of a crazy suicide run. Don't join now. And and we're so so now they're they're actually going back to people who are kicked out for quote unquote white nationalism quote unquote white nationalism. They're going back to people who were kicked out over the last three or four years and saying, "Hey, you can, if you if you uh, come back, we'll give you your former rank." We'll, like, let bygones be bygones. You just have to scrub all your social media and sign a non-disclosure agreement that you never, uh, that, that we never had this deal. That's how desperate they are to get real warfighters back in. Wow. And even then, it's like, fuck, you know, F you, why would I? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's getting harder and harder to recruit, um, you know, because of just the way the youth are today. Uh, there's only a small percentage of uh, folks coming out of high school or whatever that are even qualified. Um, that, and then once and then once you get that pool, right, that small pool, um, then you got a whole bunch of other you know hoops you got to jump through. Now once you get this guy in and you get him training and you get him in uniform, um, why you would be drumming him out is just nonsensical. Well, it, there's a there's a, a saying. I consider this guy named Michael Yon, Y-O-N. He was a, a special forces guy and a correspondent after that. He says, if, if you keep being surprised by events, if you keep saying, wow, that doesn't make any sense, wow, that's not logical, then your paradigm is wrong. That's right. You know, if, it's like the Ann Coulter thing. If, if the liberals say, 
all these coincidences just happen to happen, but it, it, what it comes down to is we flipped a coin that lands on heads a hundred times in a row. Either I'm a sucker or you're cheating. Those are the, you know, you know what I mean? There's no other option. Mm. So if you keep getting fooled and you keep can't understand, why would they do this? It's damaging your readiness. Why would they ship all our best arms to Ukraine, blow them up and not replace them? Then you have to change your paradigm. You have to find a paradigm that fits. Like if you're if you're a primitive savage native in some country and people show up with muskets and cannons, it takes a while to figure out that there's some new physical process involved where they can throw a lead ball a hundred yards, right, with a boom. And you've got to figure that out. They're not gods, but they got something going on. Then you capture some of them and you you get them to tell them, you know, it's gunpowder and a bullet. Then you start, now you've got a new paradigm that works. Now you can understand, okay, gunpowder, guns, that's why they can shoot us so far away. But you have to figure out a new paradigm. Right now the paradigm that we're working on is it doesn't make any sense. Why are they trying to ruin our military on purpose? Well, it's sabotage. The new paradigm is it's sabotage. And, and the saboteurs, it's not like 99 out of 100 are all like willing saboteurs and they didn't sign up with Klaus Schwab and the WEF, but they're cowards. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they're, using the, they're using the human dynamic of, I got 19 years and my exactly. kid's got to go to college. You take your jab or you're kicked out because if I say otherwise, I'll lose my pension. Yeah. No, that's, I've seen that. Uh repeatedly, uh, starting in 2020, uh, a few su- uh, success stories uh, of some guys that are at 19 with some change, and uh, they had to go through the rigmarole of the memorandums and, uh, you know, getting uh, letters from chaplains or pastors, uh, but then but, finally but, able to get their, you know, after all of that, but to me, but squeaking to me, that's and getting not- it. Yeah. To me, that's not a success story. That's not a yeah. success story. Because what they're saying is, oh, you got 19 and change, and you jump through 300 flaming hoops. Yeah. Maybe we'll let you stay in the military. If the same guy walked into the same chaplain's office wearing a dress with lipstick and said, yeah. my new name you know, is Josephine, that same chaplain would get down and kiss his feet. Yeah. Because that chaplain isn't a real chaplain. That yeah. chaplain is not serving the Lord. Yeah. That chaplain's worried about his pension too. Amen. Like, no, you know, in amen. the Soviet, a hearty it, it would be like a chaplain. <laughs> in, in, it would be like a chaplain in uh, Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. Yeah. That chaplain's not serving the Lord. Yeah. That chaplain is part of the machine. Exactly. So now, there is. So, uh, what about the yeah. guys that have fourteen years in? Yeah. They or got toast. no way out. And yeah, a lot of them were jabbed, and now they'll have myocarditis and be ruined. Mm. Yeah. But, but, but that's why I say, and, and it's very important. Oh, you know, you're know, you 18, you're coming out of, you know, 17, 18, 19, you're coming out of college, not sure what you want to do. College seems like a big joke. You're just going to get a woke education, have a college debt, maybe. Learn a skill like, like you know, EMT, firefighter. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, diver, welder, electrical lineman, because oh, there's yeah. no woke. There's no woke where if you if you like turn the screw the wrong way, people die. Yeah. You know um, what I mean? Yeah. You're, we up, hear, in the, you're up in the cherry picker. You're hanging from a wire. Yeah. Dealing with 440 volts. Now that's there's ex- no woke up there. Yeah, we're hearing that from a lot. Uh, that that really is uh, that is uh, reason. Is uh, yeah, don't go, don't. If you want to get brainwashed, you know, then you go get your, you know, four year degree in uh, lesbian dance theory, and uh, but yeah, if you want to survive where we're at right now, yeah, technical, learn a trade, technical skills, learn something yeah. that's useful. And, and and if you and if you would if you would tend towards, you know, um, you know, Ranger Green Beret, then tend towards, uh, you know, construction that's like. The, the hard stuff, high steel, you know, de- 
down under, way underground in coffer dams, the stuff that pays high because it's dangerous. Right. And I'm not saying it's because it's a kick to do dangerous stuff. It's because when you go to the high, high hourly wage dangerous stuff, the woke is, is at a minimum. That's true. Yeah. Because they cannot do it on, on political woke bullshit. So and and so okay you, you didn't learn you didn't go to sniper school you didn't you know uh, go to combat but everybody for the rest of your life will give you respect because it's like your job was going out in storms you know with trees breaking down and whipping all around and and uh, replacing transformers in the middle of the night well and you know that's the same as a as a qual like you know you got through seal training or you. You know, we're in house to house fighting in Ramadi. Yep. So, well, so forget the military for now and concentrate on trades. And if your and if your um, your inclination would have been to be a SEAL Green Beret Ranger, then go for like you know underwater welding. <laughs> you know? That's yeah. Go, go yeah. for that kind of be a, job. Be a hard be a hard hat diver. You know, go yeah, go 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 spend some diver. spend some time and, in Galveston Bay where you can't see your hand in front of your face. That you can't see any. It's all by feel, yeah. and and on the other end of that, if if you know, people will take you seriously, and pulling a trigger is actually very trivial part of the skill. Pulling the trigger is is the the least of it. That's like turning a screwdriver. I just it's working in a team of people where everybody on the team is saying, all of us have to be at a hundred percent. We have to trust that everybody around us is at 100%. If anybody makes a mistake, others of us could die. We That's fell, right. we got electrocuted, we drowned, whatever. Okay? So that's where you get the same kind of, of I would, I, I mean, I don't even, if this really compares, but like elite training. Yeah. But it's the kind of training where for the rest of your life, you will be confident that you can work on the on the ragged edge of things in like the danger zone in the hot zone and other people will will respect that and they will give you credit for that they're not going to say oh in 2022 you weren't in the military i would say yeah in 2022 the military was like the trans lgbtq military that's why i wasn't in it instead i became an electrical lineman mm. you know and <laughs> Well, here's the other thing. And I, I mean, help people during hurricanes. Yeah. I, well, here's the other thing too. I just had I just talked to a friend of mine that uh, I've known for thirty, forty years, and uh, you know, airborne ranger, the whole nine yards. He told me he didn't he didn't even learn how to shoot until after he got out of the military. I mean, you can get some really exceptional training uh, and do some really good shooting if that's something that you want to do. Uh, you don't you don't have to be in the military to get that kind of training for those that uh, want great. want to learn the military stuff. The, I, I, I would I would say because look, the SEAL training that I had was was based on a Vietnam type of a paradigm, where we're uh, we're not wearing any body armor because we're going to be swimming and going in and out of swamps and ditches and it would weigh us down. No helmets. It was we we were other than our outward uniforms. We were more comparable to like a Viet Cong type of a person. It was all stealth and concealment. SEALs today are like shock troops. Plates, you know, full body armor, riding in a vehicle up to a building with a helmet on, and the helmet's got, like, integrated communications. Night vision will flip down, all kind of stuff, right? So the SEAL of, of 1970s, 80s, 90s, and the SEAL of the 2020s, totally different. The mindset is the same. The skill set, the tools, the, the equipment is very different. So what's my point? If you, are, if you are an electrical lineman, you're wearing a helmet. You're wearing combat gear because if you touch the wrong thing, you're going to be like fried like a, you know, freaking uh, Frito, right? And if... You're, and you have to trust your buddy at the other end who's handling other parts of the equation. And if he does something wrong, you do something wrong, people die. That is more important than did you learn 
Viet Cong sneak through the jungle, or did you learn <laughs> Ramadi roll up in the vehicle? Okay. Uh, yeah. What matters is how did you, how were you able to function with an elite team in a dangerous environment where everybody's got to have skills and be smart and be courageous? Because if you don't, if somebody makes a mistake, people die. So I would say right now that opportunity is not in the U.S. military. But it will always be in, you know, your state, Florida, power and light, whatever. Because those guys go out in the ice storm, you know, (laughs) in cherry pickers where the sleet is going sideways. Yeah, they do. Yes, and, it's and when it's nasty. That would, That's when they that go will out. give you better. It, the, the shooting part is easy to learn, yeah. and and whether it's like okay, you just moved from uh, you know Florida to Arizona, you just went from jungle to desert. That's just a transition. Mm. Change your camo. Change you know, spread out your patrol order. Patrol a little bit differently. Maybe you can't do things in the day, or you can't do things in the night at the other place. That's all simple. That's like switching from from uh, hammering nails to um, you know doing fiberglass or welding. That's got that's not the important thing. The important thing is mindset and being able to work with other men in in an elite setting where every where you trust everybody is as trained as you are and going to have your back. That and you can't get in, in, in the military today. Maybe you can, but I mean if you if you enlisted today. You, you probably wouldn't wind up there. there might, I'm not saying there are no units like that left. Don't get me wrong. Well, they're but they're all, increasingly yeah. spread out and hard to find. That's true. Let's, let's take it to the next level, which is um, let's just say uh, things are going to get worse. Let's just say uh, the dollar is going to continue uh, doing its death spiral. Um, the economy is going to... Um, continue the inflation. We're going to continue to see the inflation, um, and and economic the economic situation is going to continue to deteriorate for the foreseeable future. What recommendation, uh, being uh, the semi dystopian near future guy that you are, um, other than yeah, I like how you, I like uh, that semi dystopian. Other other than other than too overdone and and kind of boring because it's like the the road by Cormac McCarthy. No, I, I think that I think that um, just being away from huge urban areas is a very important thing. I mean, some some lessons you learn from like every conflict, even if the conflict lives, only lasts two, three, five years, um, and maybe Ukraine. In, in ten years, Ukraine will be like, oh, remember the Ukraine war? Because I remember the the uh, the war in uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia. Now it's like 30 years past. It's like kids are growing up like, oh, yeah, there was a war, I remember. They live right there. But, oh, my, yeah, one of my uncles died, but the war is over. So, But if you happen to be in a conflict zone during those you know, one, two, three, four years, you might not come out of it. So there's some things that people can absolutely, I think at this point, say get away from cities. And, and I don't mean necessarily like, you know, you have to go to northern Idaho. Well, amen but, to that. I'm, I'm but, about but done with my city. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not Wherever one of these guys. <laughs> like, and I'm definitely not one of these guys that says the only way you can survive is like being in this part of the country. I think that a lot of the country is extremely survivable, both geographically and politically and otherwise. Like, I'm in, I'm in northeast Florida. Um, but I think that Actually, you know, today reaping the benefits of being, uh, you know, an old term yuppie, you know, uh, in in uh, you know downtown New York or Boston, well, the food trucks absolutely stopped coming. Some people are saying there's like a two week supply of diesel. You know, I mean, small things like that, like the food isn't delivered. Cities will go go haywire first and worst. So you don't want to be there like in that blast zone. You know, whether it's a, like a hurricane coming, they say, oh, it's a hurricane, 100-mile-an-hour wind. That 100-mile-an-hour wind covers like 10 miles. And then there's like a 70-mile-an-hour wind that covers 40 miles. 
You know, so everybody says, oh, it's a 100-mile-an-hour hurricane. Yeah, but only it was only the full force if you were right there where it hit. So when cities implode, don't be in Manhattan. That's like being, you know, in the eye of the hurricane, for sure. You know, don't be in downtown big, big blue city. And the further away from it you are, you know, the, the more options you'll have. Because, you know, there, there might not be food deliveries or, might, you know, water could get stopped. I would say one of, one of the biggest, like, prepper kind of things I always notice is guys have, like, you know, 10 AR-15s, night vision plates, but they're on city water. They don't know where their water really comes from. Mm-hmm. Their water stops. You don't even have, you know, you can't even carry all of your prepper gear. You can't live if you don't have water. If you're on city water and you don't know where it comes from, job one is find out where my water comes from and and then figure out what would happen in different scenarios because a group of men might have to go there and say, you got to keep working. You can't just walk off the job. Otherwise, all these downstream people are going to not have water. Hmm. You see, so it's more important. It may be more important securing your water supply than like you know, uh, guarding your own per, your your own neighborhood is also important. But if your you know, whole neighborhood runs out of water on the third day, you better already know where the water came from and how to keep it rolling. You know, that that's the kind of thing that that um, I think about. But you know, obviously, if in in our country with our social fractures already simmering, if like there could even be like a computer hack where where the uh, electric, uh, you know, the EBT cards, the food stamp cards, all stop. Mm. There will be riots in cities. The food stores will be looted. So the further you are away from, and, and being away from a city doesn't necessarily mean being in the middle of the desert because there's nothing to eat there either. You know, I, I was thinking uh, of for other reasons, not being in the city. I'm just annoyed with people, but these are oh, really absolutely. good reasons too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, they're not, yeah, it's not getting any better. better. You're better off get, get the get the terrain spread out a little bit. Yeah, and and if, if, even if you move out of the city, don't live a quarter mile from the interstate. You know, yeah, just, stuff exactly. like that. But I mean, yeah. do some analysis. There's, you know, there's a lot of people that have written great books on this subject. But I do think that we're that America has some some uh, severe problems ahead of it because. We're, we're reaching the end of, like, you know, 31 or $32 trillion of debt can't ever be repaid. You, you know, we're, we're, people are learning the meaning of the word inflation. It's like, well, it's a new concept. Yeah, well, we just printed all this money. Uh. And, you know, so, so we could be at the end of the dollar. That's maybe, that may be related to why we're fighting so hard to control Europe. I think we blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, for example. And we're 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 really trying to extend the life of the of the uh, the U.S. dollar as the world you know global reserve currency. It, it was certainly not in Russia that did that. No, and when <laughs> and when the dollar fails, they, you know when the rest of the world says, "Hey, America, it's been great, but Saudi Arabia is now going to sell oil to." these countries just for other, you know, currencies, and we don't need your dollars, we become Argentina with nukes. And it's it's a, not only dangerous, but to us it'll be like, you know, it could be like a depression. And in, and, and in the USA, a depression will, I think, turn into like a race war. Mm. Because there will be race hustlers saying, you know why there's no food? You know why there's no water? It's them white racist nationalists that did it. So, you know, there will always be people trying to, to um, you know, exacerbate a situation to elevate themselves. It's kind of like a drowning man, you know, pushing another person down, but, you know, to get, a, to get up. But, um, yeah, I, I think that America has a lot of problems built mm-hmm. in, and you don't want to be near any kind of a multicultural city when it happens. And that's, that's uh, for sure. That's well said. Now... Uh, Matt, you you uh, lived through, I believe, the Beirut bombing, and uh, I wonder if and this is you know just changing gears a little bit. But in light of what we just talked about, 
uh, what can you what can you gather from that and apply it to kind of what we've been talking today? Is that a stretch? I mean, I was a senior in no, high school. Know, I was a senior in high school when that went down. So uh, things things change. You know, one commanding officer compared to the next commanding officer. Uh, mili- military culture is not, you know, just monolithic like the Marines have always been the Marines, and that's how they'll always be. You know, from like uh, 1775 till 2022, the Marines are the Marines. So I don't want to just to cast aspersions on anybody, but the security at uh, in Beirut was pathetic at that time. And you could almost say it was a kind of like a pre-wokeness because the Marines on, on guard duty were not allowed to have magazines in their rifles. Wow. Okay? So what... what That's incredible. Yeah, what the history calls the Marine barracks was not actually a barracks. It was the Middle East Airline Building, which was for a while like PLO headquarters, and then it became um, the offices, not the headquarters, but the offices for the Marine Corps um, Battalion Landing Team. And so this building had a big central atrium. It was like a four-story building with a central atrium. Mm. So you could like see like a balcony all the way around on each floor. And so if you put a truck bomb in the middle of that, the whole building came down. Wow. But um, the Marines weren't supposed to be living there en masse. They were like the, the daytime battalion officers. So I'm, I'm, I'm only saying all this because there's a few lessons to glean from it. It's old ancient history, but it's worth, it's worth going over for future reference. So at that time, the Marines were, you know, starting to get into a little bit of pushback to and fro snipers, a few mortar rounds with the um, mostly Shia Muslims surrounding the Beirut airport, which is where the um, Marine Corps uh, battalion was. And they were the Marines were supposed to be living in, tw- in tents. Well, once you start throwing a few mortar rounds and sniper rounds around, you literally have to dig a giant hole and put your tent down in the hole. Yeah. Okay? And then sandbag it and everything. Well, if you're in if you're in a uh, environment where it's like raining an inch a day every day for two weeks, how's that hole with a tent going to be looking? Even if you got like some pallets for floorboards, the water and mud's going to be over the pallets in no time. So that really totally sucks, right? Well, there's this building called the you know the uh, it was the, the Middle East Airlines headquarters where they're supposed to have, like, a staff during the day and just, like, a skeleton crew overnight. Hundreds of Marines just moved in there with their, with their uh, you know, sleeping bags and their, and their uh, you know, rolled-up uh, foam pads because it beat living underwater in a tent, wow. you know, below mud level. And because of the morale factor, the Marine... Uh, command kind of like turned a blind eye to this. There should have been no more than, let's say, 40 or 50 people in that building overnight, and there were hundreds. Because it was, the, I'll just go to the to the BLT office and sleep on the floor instead of being a half mile away, you know, dug in with a tent that's underground, underwater, you know. So it became an inviting target, yet the, the Marines... We're so afraid of like somebody letting off around a, a negligent discharge that they were not allowed to have magazines in their rifles, and they could not put a magazine in the rifle until they called an officer and got permission. Wow. Well, this was totally unsuitable for an environment with a truck bomb that could just like ram through your barbed wire, concertina wire, and just plow right into the building. Wow. So. I guess the lesson of that is there was a, a, a colonel who did get, you know, probably I'm sure he didn't make general, but he didn't push back enough when they said no magazines and weapons, or he took too seriously people saying, above all, we can't afford to have an incident. So Marines with no no magazine and a rifle, by the time they, they, they see a truck making like one turn and zooming into a building, you know, they couldn't stop it. 
and 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 this is like marine culture of of 1983. I'm not saying like this is marine. This is Beirut 1983. It's not like I'm saying this is all Marines everywhere all the time. So don't don't quote me on that. But that's 40 years ago. The State Department in Beirut basically told the told the Seabees, the Navy Seabees, and the Marines, we want a light footprint here. We don't want you to turn this into Da Nang, Vietnam. Don't build a bowling alley. Don't build a laundromat. Don't build an exchange. Because if, if CBs, if you have CBs with bulldozers and sand, they will try to build a city. This is a fact. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because what are, what else are they going to do? You know, they got unlimited sand and bulldozers. They're going to start building shit. So. I understand the State Department telling them, don't build things. But the Marines took that to the point of, don't build anti-truck obstacles. Mm. So you, they were able to drive a truck straight in. Mm. Why am I regurgitating all this ancient history? It's because somebody might be in a situation someday yeah. where the colonel is saying, we have been told not to build anything permanent. You have to stand up and say, but sir, we've got to at least be able to stay up a truck bomb. No matter what your orders are, sir, we, with all respect, we have to be able to stop a truck bomb. And we need to have loaded rifles so that if a truck bomber is coming, we can shoot him. The Marines failed in both of those. And, and there was a, tons of other failures. I don't want to lay it all on Marines, but that was the Beirut bombing from my point of view. Yeah, and it was, I, was, uh, I, was out, I was out defending the ships. And... And we had a 35-foot uh, diesel, turbo-diesel boat called the Sea Fox. And we had intel that, that um, terrorists would try to send a swimmer team out to do like a, a limpet attack on the ship. And we took it extremely seriously. You know, we drove around all day uh, throwing demo in the water around the ships. And on my behest, we told the uh, the commanding officer of the amphibious squadron, you have to up anchor every night and go out to sea and then come back in the day, which is a big hassle. Beirut has like a, a shelf that's very close to the shore, like within mortar range. And I said, if you're like anchored overnight in mortar range, you're going to just take artillery. Yeah. So you've got to go out every night, which is a huge amount of work for the Navy. Yeah. But they did it. They, they, you know, they were like, okay, it's a Navy lieutenant is telling us we're in danger if we stay anchored, which is easy. It's like being in port. We're going to do the whole sea and anchor detail twice a day. The Marines didn't do that. The Marines allowed themselves to be attacked easily. Yeah. And I'm not just, I don't want to say all Marines all times, but in Beirut, that's what happened. Right, and uh, a lot of that was uh, just lost to the, the fog of war. But, totally. Uh, yeah. But if, but if you're in the position of being a junior officer, and you hear people like me, and you're ever in a in a uh, briefing where they're saying, you know, I don't like it either, but they've told us not to build any obstacles <laughs> on the road. You have to say, sir, I you know, didn't yeah, something happen exactly. in Beirut? I mean, you you know, you've got to stand up to the to the to the uh, colonel and say, with all due respect, sir. You know, I think I th- that's a mistake. Yeah, that's something. Uh, the uh, the parallel there, I think, uh, runs through everything else we've been talking about. Yeah, the moral courage. Yeah, the moral courage to do that. Moral courage. Yeah. That's a great. That, that's it. Moral courage. Yeah. And moral courage is like I have to balance my kids who are in grade school and high school versus my pension. Mm-hmm. That's really a big one. Yeah. Exactly. And and the and the evil doers. They know the weak points. It's like jujitsu mm-hmm. or Aikido. It's like, yeah. you know, if you twist the wrist in this way, the pain is so great that they have to submit. Yeah. Well, the evildoers say the pension is their weak point, and if we twist that joint against the pension, they will submit. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. what the evildoers do. So it takes a tremendous amount of moral courage to say to look at your wife and kids and say, "Honey, I thought in two years we'd have a retirement check, but I yeah. just can't do this." <laughs> hey, that's the real moral courage. Yeah, 
Amen. But your wife is your wife is like, what are you talking about? Just take the jab. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you coming on today, Matt, and uh, and we I want to thank you for the enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, and for our listeners, uh, if you haven't heard of Matt uh, Bracken, I don't think you get around enough. Uh, but uh, he has some wonderful books you can find on Amazon. The one we talked about today is Enemies, Foreign and Domestic. He says some uh, some other great titles. Uh, but I think uh, for a lot of uh, the listeners, it might have they might have experienced something of uh, when we watched the Oscars and Ricky Gervais uh, was. Uh, kind of letting people have it and knowing, you know, this is how it is. So I think we need to hear that. I think we need to hear uh, people like Matt telling us how it is. Uh, a lot of people are the frog in the pot. So uh, I, for one, am a, I'm a better man for having listened to you today, Matt. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks. And so- thank you. Thank you. It was a great conversation. And, th- and thank you for letting me rant. Oh. Hey, that was a great rant. Anytime. Yeah, rants that are good, you don't want to stop. Those are great. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I, I'm a boomer. I was born in 1957. The person I care about is the 15 to 20-year-old yeah. who's wondering, what should I do? Exactly. And, and, and 20 years ago, I would have said, Ranger, Green Beret, SEAL Team, and now I'm saying... You know, electrical linemen, underwater welder, yeah. EMT, wait a little bit, yeah, firework, yeah. firefighter. <laughs> yep. You got to have a little combat patience. Yep. All right, thanks. And, and but you'll get in those skills, you'll get the combat experience. Absolutely, you'll get the experience of if somebody makes a mistake, people die. And on this team, we have to be perfect, have each other's back, and that's what is important. Not whether you're crawling through a jungle or patrolling across a desert or you're shooting a shotgun or a sniper rifle. That's just that's just the tools of the trade. It's Amen. the teamwork. Yeah. It's the critical crunch time teamwork that you that you should develop at this age. That's what is important. Not did I have you know did I check mark uh, you know Ranger Green Brave Seals? No, that's not important. Thanks, Matt. All right, well, we, uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pinelander Podcast. And if you enjoy our content, we hope uh, you'll check out our sponsors. Blacksmith Publishing has been serving the warrior class since 2013. Uh, we have great titles written by warriors for warriors. And if you're looking for a great reference book or you just want to unwind in the G-Base with a great novel, uh, be sure to check out the bookstore located at blacksmithpublishing.com. And if you're looking for some cool Pinelander apparel, uh, head on over to the general store located at pinelander1776.com. Uh, great selection of shirts, hats, jackets, sweaters, stickers, patches, and everything else you can imagine. pinelander1776.com. Listen, thank you for those out there that are, are helping us uh, in our goal of developing our country's next generation of warriors. Uh, the American Agogi Project. Uh, is something that we're going to be um, officially launching next year uh, in celebration of the 10th anniversary of Blacksmith Publishing. So those out there that are uh, uh, donating for that, uh, 100% of your uh, contributions are going to that project, and thank you. Until our next meeting, keep your head on a swivel, stay mentally and tactically smart, physically and spiritually strong, and socially astute. To each other, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. May God continue to bless Pineland.